I don't know where I'm putting this clip, but I've just recorded everything you're about to see, and I just feel I, I have to point out that uh, this video's this one's different. This one's different than the normal reviews. I do what I normally do in these reviews a lot. It's probably quite long, is a part of it, but there are quite a few parts of this review that get rather serious and will probably deal no it will deal with topics that some people might find distressing and, and I, I, to the point where i feel i have to warn that i have to put a warning in the front but basically the show was doing things both good and bad mostly bad that well i try and keep this place a kind of chill channel that you can escape the world from if you wanted to it's gotten to the point where it, they were so such a core part of the show into such extreme lengths that I couldn't ignore it. I've put some general feel-good resources around. Um, description, iCards will pop up periodically. But just, just be aware that this is a slightly different and more serious video. And I still see every, every comment. I, st I police the comments as well. Um, and haven't had to yet, but we'll remove, well, we'll, I'll remove the bad, I'll remove the attacks, the, the, um, the immoral stuff. But I still see, and I have time to respond to the comments, I have my email, my public email is in the description as well, um, if for some reason you don't want a public comment. And also, wherever you are in the world, there are plenty of things like a suicide hotline or stress hotlines that you can look up. But I did need to acknowledge that if you're here for a very chill and low-key review, this is not the episode for you, and just be aware of that. Anyways, I hope you enjoy. Have a good day. Hello, and welcome back to another Picard review. Episode 6, 1 of 2, 2 of 1. It might be the other way around, I can't remember. But yes, we have a lot to talk about in the intro today, so if you only care about my thoughts about the reviews, that's why the chapters are there. Skip to general thoughts, that's usually what I call it. But I know there are a, surprisingly, a surprising amount of people who are quite loyal and quite interested in what I have to say, which first off, in the immortal words of Paradox, wow, Thanks. <laughs> but yeah, I want to do them just for those people because I don't really have another place to talk about all this stuff. And also, yes, that sentiment really only has full meaning if you've seen Steven Universe. But if you're the recipient of that sentiment and are so interested and loyal to my incoherent ramblings of opinions, then why haven't you watched Steven Universe? It's the best show ever made. I don't even have a Star Trek poster on my wall. But anyway, yes, first order of business, you can call Q. Before you rush off to do it, before I tell you how to do it, be aware it's a Los Angeles number. And a lot of people haven't thought of this, but if you're non-American, or for some reason might not be able to call Los Angeles without being charged a lot, do not do this. There are plenty of ways online you, you can see what's happening, including me up here. But... Yes, uh, that number from Picard in the um the the card that basically Q three D printed for Brent Spiner that had a non five 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 phone number on it, so you can call it, and I won't quite spoil what happens, but it is a Star Trek thing, and no, you won't have to talk to people. But yeah, I'll I might pu I'll probably put the number on screen if I can find it. Um, call that now. For fun, if you if you can call Los Angeles, otherwise my video, someone else's video. Uh, but of course, that probably won't be up forever. If Picard's still running, you're probably good, but yeah. Second order of business, what I've seen a lot of people calling The Next Generation Season 8 has been announced in Picard Season 3, which actually ties into what I was planning on talking about today. Uh, we got a little trailer where they announced the entirety of The Next Generation main cast, Except for Will Wheaton. I found out this morning that Will Wheaton actually voluntarily declined to appear as Wesley. Um, good on him for his reasons. I'll link an article in the description if you're curious. But basically, he thought it'd be more fun to talk about the season with his friends on the ready room and stuff like that. I was very surprised when they didn't announce him because he's basically the face of Star Trek at this point. With all the live stream stuff I watch, their extra shows, it's, it's Will Wheaton. But, you know, good on him for just talking about those. Maybe I'll even watch some of those Ready Room. But yeah, when he doesn't show up, don't get mad at anyone. 
Um, I mean, I guess you could get bad at Will Wheaton if you're a bad person, but he, Will Wheaton voluntarily declined. They they asked and he declined to show up as um, Wesley, which story-wise actually does work out a little bit because he's kind of supposed to be doing traveling stuff. I know his cameo in Nemesis, which I can honestly never remember if it's on screen or like only in the wide screen version. I can never remember, but yeah. It is interesting though. I'm excited for the season um, because, of course, if I want to get somewhat cynical, as we knew even before the season announced, they filmed seasons two and three back to back. So if season two has problems, season three is not going to fix them. And beyond that, if season two didn't fix any of season one problems, neither will season three. That being said, even if season three sucks, Nepenthe is one of two great episodes of Picard, the other being Remembrance. And Nepenthe is great because of Riker, and, and to a lesser extent Troy, I think most people were really interested Riker was kind of bigger and just pizza Riker is amazing, let's be fair, but the Riker and Troy combo was, it is, why Nepenthe is so great. Nepenthe also features William Riker encouraging and praising his daughter for hunting actual live animals, as I highlighted brilliantly am i poorly explained we no longer enslave animals for food purposes nicely done and it also adds a tragedy to the wonderful riker and troy's life that doesn't really add anything and actually kind of detracts from the plot in my opinion and it's still great so you can make the kind of oh they'll ruin the characters in sort of shotgun style well so many characters they're gonna ruin one if you want to be cynical but even if there are like character hiccups getting that whole cast together like Nepenthe was great because of Riker, despite the anti-Riker things they did. And yes, Worf looks like Worf. Worf sounds like Worf. Um, it's it's definitely going to be interesting. I'll have way more to talk about uh, as we actually get more from their cast. I kind of suspect it might be more cameo-esque roles, except for maybe Frakes or a few people. Uh, basically, because what I'm going to get into next, that's a quite a big cast to juggle, especially if you're keeping the Picard main cast. That's quite a bit, and this, the Picard team has never really done it. Heck, it, Discovery has never really done it, even with its large main cast. I, I, I'd have to actually run the numbers, but a lot of them kind of get sidelined. And of course, these people are older. I don't know how many of them are retired, like I, how many of them would really want to do a full-on gig, but it should be fun nonetheless to at least see these people. Uh, in their older years, these characters in their older years. Bleeding into the next point, um, which actually is going to build up on this again. After the last review, I saw, I'm actually going to get it up on my phone here, that uh, basically the nightmare ending to Picard season two. I stumbled upon this Reddit post, link in the description, which uh, I'm just going to read to you because it's it's quite insightful. I was like, oh no, it's what I'm afraid of in the second season of Picard by a uh, PTLG-225? Many people speculated that the new Borg Queen we see in the first episode is Agnes Jurati. In seeing what's happening to her and the Borg Queen in the last episode, which is episode 5, not 6, I haven't seen it either, it seems possible. Basically, Jurati, on her own will, joins to the Collective and reforms them in some way to be acceptable to join the Federation. And I speculate on this as well, that this is some set of the Collective, or the Collective actually does want to join. But what I'm afraid of, that in the end the writers will make the assimilation a good thing. With Jurati as the next Borg Queen, the Borg will just only assimilate people who volunteer to join the Collective. They will spin it in a way to promote giving up of your individuality for the feeling of connection, compassion, and belonging somewhere. Uh, I'm going to be quite blunt with my thoughts here, and then allow me to just my if you dis justify myself if you disagree. I do believe that there are writers out there, generically, ignore Star Trek for a second, who would be stupid enough to think that this is a good ending to your show. And even with my complaints about the Rios and the cigar thing, I really, because I believe this is very plausible, I, I really struggle to believe that you, anyone, could be a Star Trek writer and believe that this is a good thing. Because it, it really is that message of, okay, going back to that cigar thing, why I got so angry about, right? And, and I'm not going to go on too much because I have to have something to talk about if this is the ending in the last season. I am a nobody. 
right? I've got a decently sized channel, 200 something subscribers. As I said, I have a following. There are a few of you. I'll see in every video. You'll usually comment. You, people have told me that they are very invested in this stuff, right? But I do not have delusions on my ability to influence society as a whole. You know, this might, like, I've, I've realized recently in my analytics, my sort of last 28-day analytics, that my monthly, like, watch hours, views, and everything is actually surprisingly high. Like, I do impact a lot of people, but in the grand scheme of things, I do not have any delusions of some greater importance in the universe. And despite this, the knowledge that I'll put myself in front of at least one person in the way I do is the sort of public fi figure. You don't know me, but you feel like it does kind of thing. The amount of decisions I make even on a per basis video of what to say, what's right, what topics to ignore. Um, I I've had a few in the last week, so I'm trying to come up with an example of something. Is an ex I'm going to break my rule here. And the example has been... Uh, Russia is a country, for example. I can't remember the specific. And, and I tried to use that example in like a historical context. I went, no. I'm, I, I actually cut that. Um, I even told myself in the corner, I was editing Nathan, cut that. Because it, it had nothing to do with Ukraine, nothing to do with modern. It was like ancient Russia. But I, I make the conscious decision that I want this to be a place where I know people use YouTube to get away from the real world in a lot of places. And unless Star Trek is directly addressing the real world, I'm going to let them do that. And so I didn't want the reminder of modern things that could cause anxiety. And there's things about... It's the classic example. I really admire people. Again, it's, it's kind of hard to define. Of like um, Tom Baker and Barack Obama. A very weird subspect thinking about. The fourth doctor and the former president. Who both recognized they were stepping into very different roles, but roles that made them icons and that particularly children would look up to as role models of any kind. You know, the, the president of America is, is it was, especially back then, but is kind of supposed to be a very distinguished, good adult, a mature adult, essentially. The responsible, you know, the doctor is supposed to be a good, kind-hearted, inspiring, a, a pinnacle of morality, a Picard, if you will. And um, Barack Obama was a smoker who quit because he felt the president should not be smoking. That sends a bad message to kids. Uh, Tom Baker was also a smoker, also a drinker, if I recall correctly. And I don't know if he flat out quit, but he definitely, when he became the doctor, did incredibly like a lot of work to make sure that the outside world never saw him no kid would ever see the doctor smoking b because that would just kill everything about the doctor having your star trek message be e even if it's not the message even if gerardi the way she's going she's alone. Gerardi's thing is she's alone in every single timeline of the universe, if you want to believe that. That's like, there are people who will feel that and will believe that, and there are people who will kill themselves over it. Like, it's a very serious thing, and there are people, there have always been people who've looked to entertainment, and especially Star Trek, who is, not is it, it is a big deal. Like, if you're in charge of Star Trek, you're not the nobody me, you are reaching millions of people and you will meet generations in the future. And if you picture for a second that that high schooler, the kid, anyone who is the Agnes Gerardi, the socially awkward, no friends, they feel they're always alone in the universe in every timeline, right? And they see that she is happy in the end because she joined the Borg Collective. That, that is the message of giving up your individuality for the sake of belonging, and, and that causes true happiness. That's the message. Fuck off. That is worse than the cigarette, because that is going to cause damage years on. I mean, so will the smoking. will cause physical damage. But that mental damage is worse. That's that. Uh, what that tells me, if I'm that kid, is that, you know, if, if you're the kid on the fence, maybe you should cut your hair, lose the glasses, dress like the popular kids, 
and and just really get with an awful group of people who aren't going to like you for who you are and you're going to be miserable. But it's even more dangerous as that. There's a reply I want to read out. It's actually a string of replies because it's a cult. It really is. From actually the person who posted it again. I'm not totally against hive mind societies as a sci-fi concept, but we're talking about the Borg here. The assimilation, the process to join the collective, is an intrusive and horrible experience. And I'd like to point out First Contact Day was this week. I just watched First Contact again. This episode is uh, fighting an uphill battle. But yeah, by God, it, it's awful. Um, and I think he actually gets into what I'm about to say. You forcefully stop being I and become one with countless others who overwhelm and suppress your own voice. That's a good thing if it's voluntary now. But how do you really know that you want to stay in the collective? How do you know that you are still you and not having the other voices decide that for you? Or that being part of the collective totally acts like a drug addiction with purposefully granted euphoria and withdrawal symptoms, which kind of does, you know, the, the, with the descriptions of it. The thing that worries me that it easily can become some creepy cult that literally preying on the misunderstood and misfits. You were a loser with no friends and seeking for attention. Just join the hive mind and you will never be alone. You feel like you belong nowhere? You don't need to do the effort to find friends. Be one with the collective and you don't need to worry about these things ever again. You are mentally unstable and have anxiety? You can escape from your struggling with just being like everyone else is a Borg drone, and so on. I don't think that throwing away your individuality and giving up upon who you are is the answer to be truly happy. Running away from reality to the hive mind collective to get easy comfort instead of your fixing your life is a bad thing, and by god, this is no longer the comment, by god, it is, it is genuinely the worst message you could send even not even as a star trek just in general it is probably the worst message your show can send besides suicide is the answer it, it's it's beyond stupid that anyone could think hey this is a good idea and we're not gonna blame the writers for something they haven't done yet but god it's worryingly there's a worryingly short path to that ending and the other thing people point out is even if this is good if you join the collective there's no way to withdraw consent once you're in. There, you can't just go, okay, I'm done. Like, even if you ignore all that, it's a trap then. It genuinely is a cult that just preys on the vulnerable. It, <laughs> there have been many collectives in Star Trek before, but I think the important distinction is that you, they don't lose their individuality. The, there are the three members in um, a Voyager that come to mind that were part of a team Seven was in when she was a drone. And they really want to reconnect and keep the voices, but also keep their individuality. And there was the, I think Chakotay also found a, a com colony that was pretty similar, where they kept the voices but also their individuality, and, and that is more a lifestyle. You know, that's a way you can leave that if you want as well, and it's not damaging. It's different, but it's, I mean, it's like a hippie lifestyle, not particularly damaging. I suppose you might argue excess drug use, but let's, let's just, I'm digressing. But the concern is, if Agnes Gerardi becomes the Borg Queen, that actually frees up some of that excess cast and makes room for the more TNG people coming in. It's it's a worrying, like, getting rid of a person or two is actually going to help the story. I mean, even if Elnor never comes back, hey, there's another person freed up. I always forget he's part of the main cast. I feel like there's one other point I desperately wanted to add, but for the life of me, I cannot think of it. <laughs> yeah, basically, I really hope that that's not the path the writers choose to go. And if it is, they're all going on a list of just irredeemability. <laughs> like, you, you, with the cigarette and then that, it's it's creating a show that is actively destroying and harming the lives of the people who watch it, even in the minor ways, even if it's just one. Even if just one person enters some path like that, oh, I've remembered my point, then you failed as a writer. Like, Star Trek shouldn't even go near 
stories that could bring you down that path, but something so explicitly just cult-like and giving up who you are for the sake of fitting is awful. When I met my partner of about three years now, and a heck of a lot longer it's going to be, and they, were, they were living in their parents at the time, and on their ceiling, they had those glow-in-the-dark stars, right? You know, the classic kid's bedroom thing. Editing Nathan here with the things that sound normal until you hear them back again. I should probably point out that my partner is two years older than me, and not actually some kind of child. And I love those stars. <laughs> like, they don't have them now. They've moved out. I think I've got, like, three for testing because they haven't bought them. And I'm genuinely disappointed in the fact that they have yet to buy those stars. If I was living there, those stars would be back on the ceiling. And their bed is a good third full of plushy stuffed animals and other plushies from various shows. And then when they were a kid, Pokemon. I mean, I've got my little Bulbasaur right there, also from them. The, the point of the story is there are some minority groups of personalities, we'll say, some stuff like that, that would make it harder to fit in. And getting rid of those aspects, getting rid of the glow-in-the-dark stars on your ceiling or the plushies on your bed is not the answer to happiness, right? It might suck if you don't have anyone else of the minority group, whatever minority personality in, that, that would accept you. But it'll be even worse being a part of a group that doesn't. In the short term, it might not. It might be good to join that group, but in the long term, it's just wrong. And the idea of Star Trek potentially getting anywhere close to sending that message, that it would be better to give up those stars on your ceiling and your individuality, is deeply troubling. Anyway, I think I've gone up long enough. 24 minutes, that's a good, that's usually the length of the um, general analysis or scene by scene, so hopefully I don't have a lot to talk about Bada Bing Bada Bang Mark II. I mean, look at Picard in that suit. That's clearly the direction we're going. But yeah, <laughs> if you're still here, I guess I'll just get into the video or the episode. But uh, if they go that way, the last episode Picard is gonna be something else. It probably won't be a review. It will genuinely just be me talking about stuff like that. But hey, I always make a point. We might talk about the hypotheticals, but we're not gonna blame the writers for something they haven't done yet, because they might not do it. And there's this disturbing realization as I was going through how no one could be stupid enough for a Star Trek to do that, of all the times Chris Chibnall has written the Doctor to do revenge torture and genocide after they've already won, or weaponized racism. Oh god, there are people stupid enough to do it, aren't they? Uh, well, there's the existential shred, but hey, on the good news, Strange New Worlds comes out the same day as the Sith Picard finale, so at least we'll have something that day. God, I was about to do my com conclusion, it's been that long. Let's get into the episode. Holy fuck, I was worried about the cult ending before I spent a good 40 Maddox minutes watching someone systematically be indoctrinated into a cult. <laughs> good lord. Now, you know, let, let's be fair in that there's just as good a chance, we'll call it, that the resolution of a card is, hey this person's being indoctrinated into a cult, they think it's good, everyone's gonna step in, their friends are gonna step in and go, no, this is bad. You know, that that's good, but like, I don't know, the way some of those things were handled, like, I just watched a woman get drugged as um, the Borg Queen released endorphins and happy chemicals, so I just watched a woman get drugged and then forced to sing a song you belong to me, give everything you are to me, by the cult leader literally puppeting her body around. Oh, God. It, but, like, the tone I got from the show wasn't, this is horrifically messed up. I was uncomfortable watching watching this episode. I was deeply uncomfortable. But the tone I got wasn't, you're supposed to be uncomfortable, like uh, like when Q slapped Picard, right? The tone I got was, you're supposed to think, wow, Gerardi's got a beautiful voice. 
And she does. <laughs> she does have a beautiful voice. But... No. That's the equivalent of watching someone get stripped searched and going, oh, they've got a nice body. <laughs> no. It might be true, but the predominant feeling is this is horrific and deeply unsettling. And and that was not the tone I got from the show that that I did not get the feeling that's what the writers believed. But my solution to the like 15-20 minute intro is cutting down on the general thoughts because I actually think this would have been a fantastic one to live stream because constantly I had little thoughts and quips. Really, I think we're getting far enough into Picard now that I, I know what to expect. I mean, the writing is rather subpar, you know, where the um, plot moves along somewhat clunk clunkily, problems are brought up um, for them to be solved, and then just brushed away when they're no longer needed. A lot is predictable. Hey, guess what? Soong's daughter was <laughs> doesn't actually have a mother. She was grown in a test tube. Which I'll give them credit. It was it there was more like horror to it than just, oh my god, I was born in a test tube. <laughs> like, you know, well done on that. Uh, and that's the thing. There are beautiful scenes. I'll get to it, but the one with um Picard and well Picard was amazing it was i mean like remember it's it's one of those proper star trek doing star trek scenes it was fantastic but you also have blatant privacy violations and ethical concerns just completely being brushed under the rug you have you're developing concerning moral lessons you're leaning on cliches that in 50 years and 800 some on episodes not even the lowest of star trek is leaned on like the i'm not gonna tell people that the borg queen is inside my head um because of course gerardi is slowly being indoctrinated no actually rather quickly being indoctrinated into a cult that's something i praised even the worst of discovery didn't do i vaguely recall bringing something up in season four i was very disappointed is like the first time star trek had done it but um, there's even a line where Rios was like, we're the good guys. And I think even I even said out loud, like, wow, that totally like if you don't know what's going on, that sounds like what the bad guys would say. Like the Nazis would walk up and be like, trust me, we're the good guys. And then the character literally said, good guys don't say that. And it's like, oh, so deep. I'm like, wow, writing 101. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, if you accept that you know, every two to five minutes you're gonna go, really? And, like, it's a poorly written thing that with a lot of um, deeply unsettling morals and problematic situations, which, let's just acknowledge, is a huge thing to brush under the rug. I mean, it's, yeah, kind of your standard... Um, I, I had a realization why I went, wow. What I was thinking is this about all this as I was horrifically un unsettled and uncomfortable in the um bar scene we'll call it the meeting whatever where I went really Picard is basically like that simplistic sort of not very well thought out and problematic adult draw oh <laughs> it's pitched as that adult drama and we all knew that you know, it's the adult drama in the sense of here's some tit swearing and, you know, half-assed. It's not the good type of adult drama. It's, um, it, you know, it's kind of a bad, let's just make it dark for dark's sake. Where hey, Deep Space Nine, that's probably a, I, I, yeah, late Deep Space Nine, I'd probably call it a good type of adult drama. It, it was weird coming to that conclusion after, like, some really deep thought. And, and the word that I came to was adult drama, because that's what the genre is. Like, I feel just there's something about if you set out to make adult drama, that's your goal, you're gonna get the shit like this, where, you know, at best, you've got a decent and not you got a, a passable story if you brush so much under the rug but like if you actually set out to tell a story and that story lends itself to some of the darker more mature themes like deep space nine then you can end up with some of the finest creations in media even 
Steven Universe, a kid show, is a better drama for adults than something that's, that stands up and I ask, what are you? And they say, I'm an adult drama. Example, Game of Thrones, at least before it got bad. Game of Thrones, yes, it is an adult drama. What was What is Game of Thrones? It's a political drama. That's its genre. It's a political genre. It's also a book that someone spent god knows how long thinking out. That does help. But, uh, yeah. I might try and live stream next week. I don't know. This might have been a perfect storm, but this is one I actually regret not live streaming. What time is it right now? 1.53. So I watch these. It depends on when my roommate wakes up. At about, like, noon or 1, I'll go ahead and watch these on Thursday Pacific Standard Time. Just Google it. Um, it'll take care of daylight savings and all that. Let me know if you'd be interested in that. If, like, one person says, yeah, I'll show up to watch Picard with you, I'll probably do it. And then maybe do a little talk afterwards. But I really regret. There's so much I'm gonna forget about. But I guess, yeah, let's just get into the scene by scene. Because there's a lot I'm skipping over and wanting to talk about. Because the intro was long, I'm shortening general analysis. So... Let's get in. We're right off the bat. Oh, start at the end. Wouldn't it have been much greater to have a shock Picard get hit by a car? Like, there was a bit of a shock, but when you end with that, I'm like, well, now I know this is going wrong. There's not any real tension or anything. And there wasn't supposed to be, but going into it, knowing that you've ruined it with your 34 minutes later, oh, this is how it's going to end, and even then there's going to be no real consequences afterward. Oh, we'll get to that. Heck, I've just even realized more about how bad that is. Like, it's worse than it would have been without it. Just really, does a good writer ever do this? It's just, I, I understand it. Again, I'm not taught in writing. I'm a computer scientist. I have no real formal writing training. But as I understand it, the sort of start at the end, the like 30 whatever X time previously, has kind of seen as just a treat writing trick that ultimately hurts your story like there's probably a way you can do it well but it's it just w regardless of what quality story you started with it lowers the quality and then thinking about you know poor writing decisions what's probably an all right intro of like you've done it again what it makes me go oh that clunk having the character literally ask what so the audience can understand it like what happened it's it's weird but you know, that's a minor thing. Let's get into the plan, right? Where, um, they're, so they're waiting in line already. Even though Gerardi hasn't disabled the security system, they're already waiting in line for some reason. It, it doesn't even look that long of a line. Like, it, I don't think time was much of an issue. Gerardi's plan, right? She's handcuffed to the chair. You can't see me, but handcuffed to the arms of this chair, right? And this is an awful, oops, this is an awful camera angle, but I'm not gonna point the camera at my crotch for uh, YouTube reasons, mostly. Am I? Honestly, I would point the camera directly at my crotch, but I really don't want to have to fiddle with moving around the tripod, and that's the only reason. But anyway, she's handcuffed weirdly, and I thought it was really weird there were two handcuffs to put her to the chair. I now know why. Her plan was to be able to reach down to her crotch under her incredibly short dress, and pull out some future device to knock the guards in the room unconscious. I don't have any problems with this future device, but that plan, it is a classic Doctor Who problem of, even though there wasn't much of a cliffhanger at the end of last episode, they felt the need to have to build some peril, but then just wipe it away in an instant because it didn't matter. Because let's talk about this plan, right? First off, this plan relies on whatever they've done to Gerardi, she's able to reach her vagina. Like, that that's the plan. She, she has to be able to have that range of motion. What would have happened if her she was handcuffed behind her, like, to a pole or something? Like, you know, sensibly, if her hands were together, you know, and unable, and behind you, as, you know, handcuffs are. Yeah, then, then the universe is over. The timeline's done. We've lost. Second question. Did they not search her? Like, that's a pretty tight dress, and there aren't a lot of places you can hide something. <laughs> in fact, in between your legs is just about the only place you could hide something. Now, you may say, oh, maybe they didn't want to look up her dress or whatever, right? Not only is this the United States of America in a incredibly high-security function, this is the United States of America 
in Star Trek's 2024, which is like 10 times worse than the actual United States of America, where we do perform strip searches. Uh, in fact, this is actually a government function, isn't it? I was gonna say there might be a thing about private, um, like private security guards actually have very little power. They can't even detain you. I think it's considered kidnapping. There is such a thing as citizen's arrest. It's complicated, but like the security guard at Walmart can't stop you from leaving because they they hack they have no real law enforcement power i think it might actually be a nasa thing even though q isn't an isa thing we collaborate it's weird but the point is it, it's some government function in america where by the way we have tsa stations in airports of other countries it's awful we're awful um this this is a country i knew someone when i did a travel who in high school as well, so I don't even know if they would have been a kid at a time. I think they were slightly but older, but they would have been a, they would have been quite young, um, in the grand scheme of things. Who they had like a TSA scanner or something go wrong and detect metal or whatever on their person, and I know normally I think if you do a strip search at TSA, they take you to a little room. They had her just kind of pulled her over by the belt and had her stripped down to like the underwear, just kind of there in the security thing like america's awful you're telling me these guards aren't even gonna like oh look because there's no clearance in this dress you have a metal thing concealed in the only place you could possibly conceal things what is this again the universe is over because they're already in line then yeah you have a plan where she's handcuffed like they don't know about the borg queen like they, they also relied on her being in the actual control center which is really weird that that's where they would take her. I guess maybe you wouldn't have a holding cell, but do you get the actual police to come and arrest her? And if so, where are they when they show up? And like, I know they mentioned the memory loss, but those guards wouldn't be weird when the police show up and be like, all right, where's the where's the red dress? And they're like, the, the who? <laughs> that Again, maybe the police in this world just don't check up on incidents, because that's the second time this has been a problem in as many episodes. Continuing with the plan, I realized as Rios was getting his thing scanned and Picard was the next person in line, he was talking, just standing there talking to himself. And there were bits where like, once they got in, they're just talking to themselves. And does anyone remember how Gerardi got captured last week? Well, someone on the security camera, who bear in mind those security guards did wake up with memory loss and some weird broken handcuffs to the chair, but still watching the cameras, they saw that Gerardi was talking to herself. And not only that, this time Gerardi is talking to herself and like fighting with nobody? No one saw at any point in this anyone talking to themselves. Right. Those security guards have one job, and it's to watch these monitors. E even if their facial recognition is valid, like, you, you bring that up, you know? At best, you've, you've got someone mentally unbalanced in some way, and probably shouldn't be at some sort of high security function if they're having arguments with themselves. That's like the best case. At worst, you do have spies or terrorists. And, and so it was kind of that clunk of, oh, well, we gotta kind of get them through. We set up that there's an issue. Like, why even have there be a problem? Why can't they just go in or, or fake the IDs anyway? Like, there wasn't really any point. And in the end, the problems they introduced to get past just created more problems down the line there really kind of needed to be someone in that writer's room to actually go, hey, we're creating problems. Is there some way we can tweak the situation so that it, this works, but still maintain the tension we want? A good enough fix would probably be to just say those guys aren't going to wake up for like three hours in the security room. You, you still have guard rotations to worry about, but then you say, you know, they check the guard security Have before she leaves. Have Agnes check the guard security. Oh, it looks like, you know, these guys are on shift the whole night. Great. Boom. Problem solved. We're good. And and you could do all that in like seven seconds. Oh, and add to the all the amounts of messed up things with Gerardi being slow, no, quickly indoctrinated into a cult in incredibly uncomfortable ways is she's clearly been enhanced by some sort of Borg, Nano, whatever, in that like, yeah, she's able to do, she, she has superhuman strength. And that's not just going to be a sheer force of will thing. And even if it is, no, no, okay. Either she has Borg technology actively altering her physiology, 
invasive Borg technology, actively altering her physiology, and she still isn't telling anyone about that. Or the Borg Queen is taking um, control of Gerardi's body to such an extent that she is risking active damage to the body by pushing it beyond its limits in performing incredible feats of strength. Neither of which is good. I didn't think you could get worse than a Starfleet captain smoking a cigarette. It turns out you could. You really could. You could have a Starfleet officer. Admittedly, he didn't smoke this cigarette. You could argue that 25th, 4th, God, you have no idea how much it pains me to say these words. 25th century cigars are some sort of synthahol-like thing that don't cause damage. Irrelevant for all the reasons I outlined in um, episode one. But if, even if you accept that, because we didn't see him actually smoke it, he's excited about it. And this is a Starfleet captain. Heck, this is a person from Earth's 25th century, from the post-TNG world, who is enthusiastic about the worst of 21st century modern life. Because Star Trek's right now, 2024, is the worst of uh, the worst of us in action everywhere. And you might say that that is the case now, but really, no, it could get so much worse. For, for reasons, I'm going to actually outline some of them as we go down here. But even worse, this is a man, a Spanish man, who had been kidnapped, detained by the United States government because of a race he wasn't. Uh, he was detained for being Mexican and undocumented and an illegal immigrant and kept in a cage and mistreated and beaten and deported to Mexico. He's seen, he's experienced systemic racism in action. And beyond that, he's experienced it in a hospital of someone just trying to help the unfortunate. And he's looked at that, he's experienced that, and he's been fortunate enough to get out because of his advanced technology, which by God is their privilege greater than technology several hundred years in advance. And he's put on the nice suit, he's gone to the richest parts of um, America, and he's gone, look at the cars, the cigars, the matches in the little boxes, the intensity of it all. By God, isn't the 21st century great? Because systemic racism is happening to other people in other places because they don't have the same gifts as I do. Yeah, fuck you more. <laughs> I mean, I like... It was the moment as well, I'm like, oh, Rios is gonna stay, isn't he? Because, you know, that that's kind of the obvious conclusion. If not the the um, Mexican lady, the doctor lady, is gonna go with him. Which is, I mean, both are problematic. Staying is actually worse for the timeline. But you gotta fill some cast, like, you gotta make room for the cast in season three. And you're just a st growing up living in utopia and sending that Starfleet captain, no, sending anyone to the worst of humanity, which is what 2024, just before World War III, oh my god, this is just before World War III. Rios, it, in a major city, is willing to go through World War fucking three and the post-atomic horrors because of consumerism. If you couldn't see the complaints about ruining the utopia before, by God, I hope you do now. <laughs> oh, oh, and before you say he's in love, that's why he's excited. No, he's still going off about how amazing the 21st century is. And, and I will give, as a tourist, right? I, I don't think I've been a tourist to, like, awful places like this, you know, but... The, the newness, you know, in, in time travel as well, like of just the newness of everything, the novelty. You could go back to these awful times and awful places and, you know, presuming you're the right kind of person. Yes, that's a reference to my skin and sex. You know, you can enjoy the novelty of it, but pretty soon you're going to run into the problems of the past. Or, or any sort of troublesome area. And again, this man was deported and kidnapped and put in a cage by the government as his first experience 
in 2024's America. But hey, isn't this party nice? Here's another one. Besides literally watching every moment of this woman's life, including the most personal, and knowing everything about her, down to a little mannerism in signs of spirals of depression that no one else knows, because otherwise they'd be watching her and intervening. Y you know, you also can watch her entire phone history, and actually everything she does on her phone. Everything. Yeah, it, it's in the means of keeping her safe. Ooh, you know what I've just realized? That's what the NSA says as well. But I would rather die, genuinely, if someone would keep me safe you know, keep me on my predestined good life history, right? I know Q's intervening, but even without that, keep, if someone would keep me on the good, a good life, but have that kind of access to everything, it keep, but keep me safe, I would rather die. And this is being just completely ignored. I, I can try and defend it. Like, I suppose Picard doesn't know the importance of a mobile phone. Heck, the law doesn't recognize the privacy of the mobile phone and that kind of data. But it's... I would rather die. And the fact that it's not even being brought up is a potential problem. Like, what we have here is a woman who sees herself as sort of a motherly figure of this other woman who doesn't know she exists doesn't know who she is, and doesn't know that she literally has no privacy in this world because at all times, everything she does, except her thoughts, are being watched by this woman. And even then, even then, when she articulates her thoughts to anyone, her therapist, her friends, her loved ones, her family, when she goes in a corner to cry alone where no one can see her, someone can. And it's to keep her safe, and I would rather die. But hey, Picard doesn't have a problem with it, so I guess it's okay. He he's like, oh, maybe it's you who can't let go. And, and again, hey, like, not letting her know has kept her safe. No, not letting her know has gotten her to this point where history is literally going to unravel if you don't intervene immediately. Like, I would rather die. I don't think I could stress harder how much I would rather die. And I have lived for years on a policy of not keeping secrets of my own. At least, that, that's probably an important thing. Like, people can confide in me. I'm not going to tell you my bank password if you ask. But, like, you know, I, I won't keep secrets. And I would rather die. But no, Picard, console this poor mother on being too protective of the child she stalks. And not try and wean her off of this horror. Like, yeah, she was texting Q right? Her deepest thoughts, you know, let's get beyond that. What if she was texting her friend who had actually messaged her because that friend was going through a tough time because uh, her girlfriend is contemplating suicide? Yeah, you know, how many people's privacy have you just violated because it wasn't actually a big deal. You didn't have to know that. God, fuck these writers. Uh, I mean, I, I I pride myself in kind of the openness and even if I don't like the show, not blaming the writers or attacking them. But the moral problems in a Star Trek and in with Park Card, it, and we haven't even gotten to the cult stuff yet, is getting to the point where just generally... If I was Alex Kurtzman, they'd be done. It, they would have probably been kicked off at some early point because these aren't people I would ever trust to convey a message to anyone. And you know what really concerns me? You know what actually makes me afraid? Is that this wasn't a writer. This was a group of people. And like, sure, the quality problems, whatever. But these sorts of problems... No one raised their hand and went, I think I see a problem here. That makes me afraid. Oh yeah, you also, the Borg Queen in her indoctrination uh, also forced Gerardi to rape a guy. You forgot about that. Is it rape or sexual assault? You know what the answer is? Semantics. It doesn't matter. <laughs> the important thing is how wrong what just happened is. And she still didn't go, 
hey, I've got the Borg Queen in my head and she can actually take control of me, that might, that, that might be an important thing to share. That's the one that really gets me. When I talk about cliches that Star Trek has avoided for 800 episodes, this is it because it's just so bad. And when you see shows like Star Trek, and God, I, people complain that Star Trek does it. I never see it. But the, the golden example is the Orville. If you've never seen it, maybe skip ahead until this picture changes, right? Mute and skip ahead if you don't want the spoilers, because it's generally an amazing scene. Go watch the Orville. It's peak Star Trek. But there's an amazing scene in the Orville will someone who, if I recall correctly, is a bit, like, insecure, you know, they're, you know, it's a crazy, it sounds crazy, right? They basically think they see a nightmare clown in the corridors, right? Like, literally, the clown from your nightmare just standing in the corridor, right? And then it goes away, no one's around, and she goes, and, and like, you'd sound crazy. Imagine, like, you're in the army or something, and you go to your commanding officer, and you go, sir, there's a nightmare clown in the corridor. No one else can see it. There's no, we're in a, you know, a submarine. No one can get in, no one can get out, but by God, there's a nightmare clown. No, the, the obvious answer is she's hallucinating, right? And, and obviously, and you go, oh, you don't want to say you're hallucinating, right? But she goes to the captain immediately, or someone at least, and goes, Sir, I know this sounds crazy, but I saw the nightmare clown. Like, I saw a clown. There is a clown. I'm not seeing things. There's a nightmare clown on this ship. And of course, they do what any reasonable thing person would do, because this is what you do in this situation, and go, Look, you're probably wrong, but we have recordings. Let's just check, right? And then... You know, if there's a clown, we'll deal with it, but otherwise we'll get you to sickbay. It's all right. My camera just stopped due to insufficient write speed. That's never happened before, but I'm going to hope I didn't lose much and just continue. Because it's the most unsettling thing that happens, right? When you see the security footage and you see the security officer who says they saw the nightmare clown. And you see the nightmare clown in the security footage and everyone goes... Oh, there's a nightmare clown on the ship. Because as these are all professionals, even Gerardi, she was like, she's the Earth's lead. No, she's the Federation's leading expert on cybernetics. She's a professional. Like when you tell people stuff like, hey, the Borg Queen is inside me. You just tell people that. And especially as it gets worse, it's just the worst thing to watch. I've never seen the, I'm not going to tell people about this obviously wrong thing that's going to cause problems, and thought it improved a show. I actually stopped to look this up when Adam soon came in. The National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, may accept and utilize monetary gifts, donations, or bequests given as check, cash, or money order, provided they are unsolicited and offered without conditions on their use. Because I didn't think you could really donate to a space mission. Also, when you're thinking things out, this mission launches in three weeks. It's a mission to Europa. What the hell is a cash donation going to do? This thing's been funded. Like, they got to keep it up, but NASA's already got its communication stuff. Otherwise, they wouldn't send the mission. They've got mission control. I can't imagine that the Human Space Flight Center is really in needs of upgrades. That seems kind of important. The, the, the size of a monetary donation to get on the board, especially when you're Dr. Evil, right? It, what has he done? It, and then on, he actually, I get maybe, hey, this guy's a danger, remove him. That's not really a quest, but hey, I want Rene Picard off this mission. Bam. The, no. Like, they can't do that. You have to give some slack. I do really believe this. In that this is Star Trek's 2024. The society is about to collapse. Is it 2026, World War Three? Like, it's soon. And um, I, I liked, there was a line as well where Rene said, Picard's like, I know what you're thinking. And Rene said that they let anyone be astronauts now. And that helped with my thoughts of she would never fly. Like, by God, she would never fly, as I've said before. But this is a society on the brink of collapse. Corruption everywhere. Like, yeah, you know, NASA might just go, sure, I don't get why they'd actually need the money or even bother with the corruption. Like, if you donate to the program, not NASA, specifically this program. You know, anyways, it explains why you get these sort of worse, um, non-ideal na astronaut candidates and stuff and why you might get this corruption. 
but still it's I don't really understand like what this is who's a person who's not so extremely bad that it's the basically saying Hitler but also appropriately bad do we just not have a middle ground anymore ah there we go any actor who's been cancelled, any act, anyone accused of sexual assault, there we go. It's like if someone like them, Jack Bowerman, I don't know, Jack Harkness from Doctor Who, it's, <laughs> sorry, I've just ruined a lot of people's Doctor Who experience, um, who didn't know. It's like if Jack Bowerman gave a big donation to an organization that didn't really need it. You'd sit there and you'd go, yeah, I guess we could spend this money in places, but like, it's Jack Barrowman, and that's gonna come with a lot of negative stuff and publicity. And do we really need that? Like it's it's a re it's the reason people get canceled is what I'm saying. And it it feels kind of weird. They just go, oh yeah, Doctor Soom, the modern Nazi doctor. Please come in. I know you just got kicked off of some. You got your license revoked for ethics violations and eugenics, but come on in. We could use more RAM in our computers. Even then you don't. This is a Europa mission. The light delay. Like, really, you could run it on a potato and it's not gonna matter. Okay, again, let's take all the very important and meaningful morale and ethical problems with this scene and set them aside for a bit. Acknowledge them, but we're gonna talk about something else that's objectively less important. You're the, the bass. The, the bass? The bra you're playing a trumpet in the orchestra, right? And all the lights go off. Ah, power out, event ruined, right? You know the schedule, it's like, oh, it's done. And suddenly, someone starts singing. And I actually thought originally, I'm like, wow, like, you know, someone just had that nailed. They're like, oh, the lights are out. I know how to set this. I thought this was some random person trying to be like, nah, let's keep the party going. Hope, like, just see if the lights come on. Um, but no, it was Gerardi who goes on for a distraction, and I guess the security guards forget about the terrorist in the building is soon. We could hear him quite clearly say, hey, that man's dangerous. But I, actually, I'd be more concerned if someone just told me, hey, this man's dangerous, and all the lights went out. Thank God no one was like a pace, had a pacemaker or anything either and just dropped dead. But wait, Picard is a pacemaker. Anyway, you know, she goes on and she starts singing a thematically appropriate song, right? And yeah, that, that goes on. It, it, because you don't know she's actually being indoctrinated into a cult. Simultaneously, the entire orchestra, who not only knows this song by heart, uh, or it was coincidentally on the bill for the evening and they were just like, oh, sure, let's do it. Simultaneously, they all decide, you know what? Let's just roll with it. Let's start playing this song. In the spotlight crew, I like to think it went on her late because they were like, hang on, where where is this person? And I, I totally get that. Like the tech guy behind the scenes, they're like, what's going on? It's like someone's singing. I'm like, I don't know. Like, should we shine the light? It's like, well, why not? I mean, you know, let's just give her the light. Like, yeah, I, I totally see that. Editing Nathan here because it's amazing how sometimes we'll miss the obvious. Why does the spotlight work? But, like, the entire orchestra knows this song and is just prepared to, like, bam, get going. <laughs> Were they assimilated too? But, no, in, in seriousness, I was deeply uncomfortable watching, like, this entire thing, other than the, the really good scene. Just the, the entire thing in the courtroom, I was deeply uncomfortable. Um, not just because they're showing something uncomfortable with Gerardi being indoctrinated into a cult, uh, no, let's call it what is. Just having her... Uh, well, actually, yeah, having her individuality stripped away to join the Borg Collective, I, I suppose that is a cult. Even if you kind of ignore that aspect, the fact that I didn't feel the writers going, this is supposed to be uncomfortable. I love Steven Universe. Steven Universe Future is the most, un like, wholeheartedly, from start to end, it is the most uncomfortable viewing experience I have ever had, and it messes you me up. It's also supposed to, and they real it's supposed to be a show that deals with really uncomfortable things, and it does it amazingly. And you, there's a difference between that kind of uncomfortable and this kind of, I don't feel like you know what you're dealing with, and beyond that, even if you did, I'm deeply concerned about the people who in a less secure position than me 
watching this and what they might do, and I start considering if and how many deaths are going to be a result of this episode, or even are already. I know I said that I try and keep this lighter. I think that's what I want to be, is the lighter place. But I think this show is crossing a line where I have to acknowledge this stuff, and that is the moral option. No, it's a moral obligation that... I'm just not seeing from this show. I mean, thank God it's always a three-season deal. That's honestly, it's just, it's it's disturbing. The, the ending might make it better, and on a binge, my concerns would be less, but like, we gotta wait a month for that, and a lot can happen in a month. I think I want to take this moment to just recognize I'm still a small channel, and I see every comment. I don't, sometimes I don't always have something to say, but I see every comment. I, I will reply to comments that need replied to. I have my public email as well. It's in the description on my channel. I have a public email address and I'm still small enough that I will see messages and I have the time to respond to them. Pivoting a ways, <laughs> quite a ways. This was a lovely little surprise. The uh, OV153? 165. I got the XCV330 in my head. That was a nice surprise. I've got faith of the heart. Like, yeah, and that makes sense. We never really had a time frame for all those kind of future things in the Enterprise intro. I think it's supposed to be an Enterprise, but yeah, nice to see it. I don't have my model here. It's packed, of course, 300 miles away, but that was lovely. And yeah, it, this scene, this was one of the best scenes in Star Trek. Um, I'll change the image. Here we go, because you see... <sighs> When I was in high school, would have, I would have been younger than 16, because a key part of this story is I could not drive yet. Um, pro pro probably freshman year, actually. Probably would have been a freshman. So eight years ago, eight, seven, eight years ago, there was this quiz game, if you remember, that was quite popular. Um, it, it had like a spinny wheel. You did it with your friends. It would land on a category. You'd answer questions. I think till you got it wrong, then it would go to like your friend and they'd answer, and it'd kind of go back and forth. I might find it. That's probably enough if you remember, if you're maybe about my age, or heck, if you had a phone back then. It, it was like Wordle, you know. Everyone did it. And when I was in high school, I did Knowledge Bowl all four years, um, which if you don't know, it, it's often described in shorthand as Jeopardy the Sport. It's a trivia, um, general knowledge, generally leaning towards stuff you may, or school subjects, but it, it can be all over the place. We've had some really weird questions. It's good fun. But, you know, you, you need to know a lot of stuff. And generally, people who are good at knowledgeable are good at that. Jeopardy, those apps, all that sort of things. Uh, they're the people Jeopardy would never put on the show. And I was quite good at knowledgeable, if I say so myself. I was captain of the varsity team for two years. I was on the varsity team for a year before that. Um, it was a very good school. Where they, it was the kind of school where when we walked by, people would murmur, is that my school? I don't really want to say the district. But yeah, is, like, is that them? They called us the Harvard of the Valley, genuinely. And that's not a joke, by the way, the murmuring, because my parents, when they would go to the competitions, would tell me about how people would murmur when we went by. Like, we, we were one of the big schools. So yeah, I was very good at general trivia. A little less so now, because I'm not in high school constantly learning as much. But yeah, I'm very good at that sort of thing. And uh, I had, why I joined Knowledge Bowl originally, I had to wait like an hour um, after school, because my mom uh, was a teacher, so she was kind of busy. She couldn't pick me up. As I said, I couldn't drive. So I had to wait around in the school for like an hour uh, after school ended for her to come pick me up. And it was one of the days that wasn't Knowledge Bowl, so you know, I was just kind of in a bench uh, by the front, where a lot of students who have to wait or whatever will kind of mingle. And behind me, I think it was like a back-to-back -back situation, I don't remember, next to me, behind me, somehow, we weren't staring at each other. There was a girl, uh, and I think maybe some of her friends, I don't remember, but there was a girl who was playing the trivia game, right? And uh, yeah, yeah, because it would have been with friends, because she was talking about it, right? And she'd be like, oh, what's this? You know, she, she'd like read the question aloud. And often they didn't know it because most people don't know general trivia like I do. My uncle runs, today I found out, it's like, a, you might know it, a general general knowledge thing. So like, I, I would get a lot of random general knowledge. I still do, and I have an amazing memory. So like, I'm as I said, I'm good at these games. This is a plot point that I'm good at these games. And so 
I was sitting there, I don't know, doing my homework, like looking down the whole time, never even looking up. But every now and then, no, quite frequently, um, more often than not, when they didn't know the answer, I would know it and I'd just say it. I might have even been mildly annoyed as I'm trying to do the work and these people are like, going off and I'm like oh this is random this is the height of the statue of liberty and they're like oh yeah and so it, i really helped their game a lot but i was just doing homework for you know quite a while and at some point they left after a while you know it, it, it had been going on for a while and at some point they left and so i was looking on my paper whatever writing stuff and the girl got up um and kind of walked in front of me and was like oh thanks you know and i i ignored them working on them i mean i I was a different person eight years ago. I wasn't being mean. I'm autistic. Um, I've said before, it's very autistic thing. I was just like, whatever, you know, they'll go on. I heard their thanks. And they stood there for a bit. I could see their feet, you know, as I was doing in my homework. And they, they, they thought I didn't hear them. You know, I, I didn't have earbuds in probably. I was never really that kind of person. I don't remember. But, you know, I ignored them. So they stood there for a bit. Um, and I just thought, oh, they ignored me. And then they tapped my shoulder right to get my attention and so I looked up and they just kind of smiled at me and were like hey thanks for the help you know just smiled thanks for the help and then they left right they probably forgot about me by the end of the week like you know they maybe they remember that nice quiz thing for a little bit but they they will never remember me right that was a nothing moment in their life that was eight years ago, and the only detail about this story I remember is when she thought I didn't hear her, so she took the time, the ten seconds out of her day, to just tap my shoulder, get my attention, and thank me for helping, because she, she just thought it was important enough. And for as long as I live, she will never remember me, but I will never forget her. Because there's just something about that small 10 seconds for just a stupid little thing that doesn't matter. I helped her on her quiz game. I screwed over many of her friends on the other end of the phone. Like, she, I, she, she cheated at that game, essentially. But, you know, it's just something about it, it made my day, and it really did for a while afterwards improve my mood, which back then was probably quite an achievement, being autistic and all, like, you know, most of my emotions were still suppressed back then, but I will never forget her. I, I don't remember what she looks like, I'm face blind, I remember, but the, I will never forget that. And that is why this scene is one of the best, it is tied for that peak star trek scenes because it's it, it was someone who got that i i sort of said last episode is a sort of complaint but joke because you know i like to give them the chance to prove me wrong of um are, are they really going to cure her of her depression and anxiety in like an hour three hours <laughs> you know because it, it doesn't make sense as we see she's so i don't want to say far gone because there's always coming back. But she is so far from okay that it's going to take a lot to get her to be okay consistently. But the right thing, the right little thing, and it can take so little to get her okay enough. And just the Picard as he was, the just the nice old man who, the, the girl who took 10 seconds out of her day to just stop and say thank you. And the look up, you know, get her, she, you know, she instantly, you could see her light up, as a lot of people will, um, who are like her. It was just the thing she's passionate about. She clearly knows this ship. She knows her ship. She's a trained astronaut, even though she doesn't, even though she doesn't think so. And even though I've said she would never be hired, she is good enough. Her only problem is she doesn't believe it. The The reason she's not good enough is she doesn't believe it. Other than that, she is good enough. She's qualified for this mission. Which, incidentally, she did mention there were other people in the crew. Uh, it's not just a solo mission. Like, yeah, she can do it. And it just gave her that brief enough moment to make her believe she could do it. No, to make her know she could do it. To go through and say, 
I'm not going to back out. To go, I can go the three days, get on the mission, and it might be hard. It will be hard. She might be surprised. Maybe it won't, but just acknowledge it will be hard. But I can do this. And yeah, she, she, the show doesn't need to cure her mental ailments right now. Like, it doesn't need to get her perfect. It It just needs her to take those first steps or even to just know she can do it for a little bit because once she gets up there she can do it and i mean just seeing she can do it is going to be enough or hopefully it should be enough to help her get going and get help but this was a beautiful 10 seconds out of your day and i mean it's longer than the 10 seconds but i think you get my symbolic point like just the nice old man or the patient girl who just took the time to make someone's day. And if it weren't for the end of the world, you know, Picard would forget this. Like, if you're the Picard in this story, you don't remember this. You, you're not supposed to remember this. It's a nothing to you. But me and Renee will never forget it. And that's the passive moral guidance because if you show people th stuff like this if this is what you put people in front of on the tv that's the world you're going to get you know even if it's just one percent of the millions of people who watch this just one percent of the time that they're in the situation the one percent will do this that's a few hundred people what is that even a few thousand people? Yeah, if a million people watch this show with God knows more people did, and 1% of the time, the 1% did it, 100 people have had an experience that they will never forget, it will change their lives and may have even saved it. And it's why I get so passionate about stuff like this and why I am I attack. I do. Why I will attack people who do basically anything else in this video is because these decisions have an effect on the world and they matter and even the nobodies like me need to be cognizant of that and the people entrusted with the mega the mega viewpoints need to do it and Everything Picard said was just perfect. I don't have a complaint about this. And hey, we got some proper setup as well. It's like, hey, the fastest way is just to go outside, right? Oh, I guess that's why Picard wasn't going to go all the way in, because he's not a real security guard. That makes sense. But anyway, I found it kind of weird when Adam did the hit and run, that he didn't just turn around and like hit the hit Renee as well. I, I guess it's, I think it does it really well where like Adam, Adam is not an evil person. And I'll say a lot, I don't believe in evil, right? In the land of fiction, sure, you know, you can have, your, your most basic story is always a good versus evil, right? Evil can exist in fiction, but I don't believe in evil because evil is, in brief, the knowledge that what you're doing is bad and, and the knowledge that there's no good in it and doing it anyway and doing it specifically for the purpose that it is bad. And will cause pain. And Adam's not a bad man in that sense. He's not a bad person. Because yeah, he's misguided. Sure, so was Dukat. But internally, he's believed up until this moment that what he is doing is right because it's for the good of humanity in the future. And yeah, he, he's right in that if the technologies he want existed, the world would be so much better. You wouldn't have genetic disease or disability, or <laughs> genetic problems, gone, all of them. But I think you have the moment where, you know, he hits, when he, when he kills someone, you know, when he crosses that line, he has the realization that not only what he's done now, but a lot of what he has been doing is wrong and trying to internalize that. And, you know, it's interesting character-wise what he'll do. Will he snap? Will he turn good? How far will he go? Given how sort of cliched this writing is, I imagine he'll snap, kind of be conflicted until the final moment where normally I'd say he sacrifices himself to kill Q. You can't really kill Q by God, don't kill Q, you maniacs. 
But um, yeah, it'll probably be something like that. He's bad, turns good at the end. Yeah, I'll spoil it. Kai win. <laughs> you know, if you're here, all the Star Trek's on the on the table for spoilers but uh yeah yeah that you could kind of argue it that way like in tandem with the next scene but watching it now it was kind of weird like i don't know just turn around also i hope he stole that car because like or like there's repercussions because maybe his get home is like he knows he can't get away with it because even if he stole the car this is 2024 america star trek's america you're telling me there isn't some sort of surveillance like we saw the technology that dr soon had with those drones you're telling me there aren't, like, police drones in this? In Los Angeles, correct me if I'm wrong, but don't you even have, like, metal detectors in in front of schools a lot of times? Like, you're already a nightmare dystopia. You, you live in your America, you're already a... It's just levels. When you're an American, when you're a sensible American, you kind of have to work on levels of dystopia. And that's what I talk about when I say 2024 Star Trek is worse. Like, America's on a level... A certain level of dystopia but you know there are many many more layers above it god and and the fact that i said that with a smile is exactly why rio should not be enthralled by 21st century america this has been a gloomy video i'm gonna link in an icard right here an um, a great video uh and actually really informative it, i mean by the title i think it's called we will stop climate change by Kurtz Gassad, because I know this has been a pretty heavy one, but I do genuinely believe the world is getting better. Now, I'll get serious. Even with, you know, the war with Ukraine is awful and atrocious, and there is no redeeming good, and it will have effects in all areas of life, like everywhere, but beyond what any of us even know. I, I don't know why I can say some of these things ending with that. Not laugh, but I think you know what I mean. It's it's not, it is serious. But I genuinely believe that one man, Vladimir Putin, has decided to do this awful thing, and it has highlighted how much better the world has gotten and how much we're improving since World War II. The, the last time something like this has happened. And beyond that, how much harder it is to do atrocities like this. Um, when, when you look at things like people who will rent Airbnbs in Ukraine they never intend to visit, or the, the fact that America could just decide not to import Russian oil, that it will have drastic effects among the economy, and that 70-something percent of Americans will approve of that. Before it was announced, when it was announced, was something I thought we would never which would not ever happen. But the point is that video is about how even with climate, at least, when nothing has gotten done at the high levels, and in fact people have actively been working against it, that most experts believe we've avoided the apocalypse, the end of the world, and yeah, while it's still dire, the fact that improvements were made during the decade where nothing got done and we a lot of people actively worked against stopping the climate change, we still pushed back three degrees to the end of the century, is amazing. And, I mean, it shows hope that things can change because the world has been getting better. I did not expect this video to be as serious as it has been. And yeah, there's something to just lighten your mood a bit. And we'll make, we make the world a better place here. In my little land of nobody that doesn't matter, it, it matters to the dozens of you that are going to watch this. All right, lovely touch with the defibrillator blowing it up. But are you telling me that a doctor who where these people couldn't go to the hospital because they had microchips that doctors would freak out about couldn't notice that this man is a synthetic being? And he is. Uh, they went out of their way, weirdly, to point out that Gul Dukat is the reason Picard has a synthetic body in the Confederation timeline? This body, it is still synthetic, which is weird, but okay. She didn't realize? Like, really? Surely it's some sort of metal. Like, it shorted out the defibrillator. You know, it, it's, it's surely not just purely organic. Soji isn't. Is, is she? She's not pure organic. I don't recall, but like, you notice and i did appreciate when they're like we're gonna go into his mind someone was actually like wait what like no this is an awful idea i mean they kind of got around it but it was fun to see sort of that 
how like blase they are about it often to be like yeah all right it, it's kind of weird i don't understand why this is happening to him at all uh, i don't remember the medical term for in your head but um yeah your brain can cause real physical symptoms but again and i do have to acknowledge how many times i have to say you can wave it away by in this it, it's far too many but you can wave it away by picard is a brand new form of life like there is literally no being in the universe like him right now, physically, and even mentally, his brain is part of his body. And Discovery did acknowledge, you know, this didn't become a thing people do because of complications with the transfer as well, but maybe this is just one of those things, one of those reasons. Also, I've been recording for 37 minutes and I know my camera stopped. It and so I know already it's more than like an hour of footage, so we're gonna go kind of quick. I briefly talked about these scenes already, the the whole thing was suing at home. Um, the file thing was nicely done, if yeah, horrifically predictable, and even Soji. I guess maybe it's hard for her to accept, but not just going, oh, I was grown in a vat. You think there might be clues to that? Things that kind of start making sense? It's like like when you learn... Um, you have a disability you never knew. Or even you start suspecting a lot of things very suddenly. You just go, huh, yeah, that makes sense. You know, I, I'd imagine it'd be a lot like that. Although potentially more traumatic in this in this uh, case. Not because she was grown in a vat, but more everything surrounding her father being a mad scientist. But I just want to point out, uh, as well after that Strange New Worlds trailer that probably just for the trailer had that weird cut. One of those photos was so poorly done. It was on screen for half a second, but I'm like, this looks like you've, like I, who photoshopped Brent Spiner's face onto some guy who probably wasn't even the right skin color. Like, I, I, I couldn't do that. It was, it was, God, real bad. And I don't know which one it is. But yeah, I, I just have to highlight that. The Discovery VXX, no, sorry, the modern Star Trek VXX team, normally phenomenal. But every now and then, like, what was that? And yeah, there's a conclusion, gonna be real quick, um, because of the time. Let me know if you'd want to join me around like 11 to 2 sometime in that window pst thursday for a live stream if one of you with guarantees like i'll show up then I'll, I'll probably do it we'll just see how it goes you know we'll just see how it goes it'll probably be rough as heck um because i don't know what i'm doing but we'll see how it goes and i think it could be fun but beyond that yeah a really serious episode probably the most serious and deep i've gotten on the channel but i suppose let me know what you think about that style of stuff i don't think your descent matters at all quite frankly but maybe where to put it how to deal with certain things will do i will i will make a good space or it by god i'm gonna try and i've already do a lot and have done a lot to try and ensure that but you know, let me know what you think. This was a rather weird episode. But yeah, we're still gonna come back next week for episode 7 and hope the writers really don't make me have to do cleanup, honestly, with, with their finale. But hey, I hope you enjoyed. Thanks for watching. If you made it through, God, this is one I want to know if you made it through on. Because a lot of you say you watch all my videos all the way through, but uh, what do we want our weird phrase to be this week? I don't know if I'm going to cut that in. I keep... Can you say it? How about vagina tranquilizers? A call back to the beginning. If you've made it all the way through, just put vagina tranquilizers in the comments and really make the YouTube algorithm hate this episode. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Beware of those vagina tranquilizers.